So we are reading. From a very wonderful script, and most of you are familiar, some of you may not be so familiar with Bhagavad Gita. I first came across, first read the Bhagavad Gita in 1970, um, when I was studying in Portsmouth in the UK at that time. And we, somehow or another, we were fortunate to um, be introduced to different individuals, different teachings and so on, philosophy, whatever, from uh, different parts of the world, enlightened persons who share spiritual knowledge with us. So, this kind of idea is spoken by. Krishna, form of the Supreme Lord Himself, for all of their benefit. It's knowledge, it's not so much a, a religion, but rather it's knowledge of life, knowledge of ourselves, knowledge of the truth, um, which we're all searching after. So I believe that you're reading regularly from the Bhagavad Gita, is that correct? In the evening, is it correct? Uh, so where do I read from? From the 14th chapter. Anywhere? Yeah, well, you see, we take 10 verses at a time. Which, oh. <laughs> so I that will take that, the 13 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> well, but anywhere, anywhere in the 14th chapter that you think would be a verse that we could concentrate on. Oh, I see. You take 10 verses at a time? Well, you, you, know, you can take one if you prefer. No, one. Okay. And verses so you don't mind where we read from, is that the idea? Yeah. Okay. Well, there are 18 chapters, and we're reading from the 14th chapter, which is entitled The Three Modes of Mature Nature. And again, I don't know how much many of you. Is anyone else coming for the first time? Is that you? Is your first time here? What is your name? You are okay. Uh, my hair is not good because of the sound of my throat. You can call me Kim. Kim. Tim. Kim. Kim? 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 Uh, so. Kim? Uh, Kim. And where are you from, Kim? Uh, from Stockholm, Sweden. Stockholm? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Sweden. We just had a big festival in Stockholm. Not the after, just left, just left it. <coughs> Yeah, anyone else the first time? First time? Your first time here, is it? Hey, Harry Ball! Hello, Sia, Harry Ball driver. Harry Ball, good to see you again. Harry Ball, Nanda. Harry Krishna. So, everyone else, you're a little regular, familiar with Bhagavad Gita? Mother, you can answer that question. Is everybody, a few, couple of new guests are here, but... Most people are here. Very usually. Okay. You'll have to excuse me if we're sort of speaking... We're not starting at the beginning, you can say. We're taking up this teaching at a certain point. This is the 14th chapter of this transcendental text. So, we're going to read... Um, Chapter 14, huh? No, I don't know, you haven't given me any, any particular clues here. Um, I'm prepared. Let's see, what should we read? Well, I'll just read a very simple verse. This is the 26th verse of this chapter. Three modes of material nature. The whole material world is basically running under the direction of the material energy, sometimes people call it maya in one sense, of illusion, but it's actually very systematic and very, nothing's happening by chance, and there are three, three modes of material nature with multiple interactions between the modes. The modes are very simple, goodness, passion and ignorance. 
passion being the you could say that the mode the mode which motivates us, drives us, you know, ambition and so on. And ignorance is like laziness and inertia. So things would be sort of like almost like, you know no drive. And uh, uh, and goodness is, is aspiration for elevation, a better lifestyle, pure living and so on, living with nature and on a higher level coming to the spiritual platform. So this chapter does describe some of the characteristics of um, the three modes of nature and how different people influenced we're all influenced by all the modes, actually. But some people more one than the other. Um, and how they, they think and act, I suppose we could read a few verses and then if the verse was wrong, we might be maybe talking. Uh, let's go back. Yeah. Uh, ah. And we'll start here. Material nature consists of three modes. Goodness, passion and ignorance. When the eternal living entity, the eternal living entity is not the body, it's the soul. The body is just a result of our karma. And we all have bodies which are basically constructed um, in different modes of nature. Some human, some not human. But uh, when the eternal living entity comes in contact with the material nature, oh, my dear Arjuna, Krishna speaking to his devotee named Arjuna, he becomes conditioned by these modes. It means we, we, we identify with those modes and the body which we receive according. And we, we usually think that this is me, this body is me, or the mind is me. But actually they're just temporary um, effects of the combination of the modes of nature. So when we say somebody is beautiful, it means they've, reached, they've got a, a material form as a result of their past activities, which may be relatively beautiful to certain people. But it's nothing directly referring to the actual living entity. It's just the dress, the physical form is like a dress, or the mind, it's a subtle dress, which the living entity is identified with, covered by, um, and more or less controlled by the mind's demands, and the limitations and the drives of the body and its senses therein. Um, whether we're in a human body or a non-human body, the principle is more or less the same. The difference being in a human body, we have more ability, especially intellectual ability, to um, adjust things or to think beyond just the modes of nature. We see early in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna Trigunya Vishava Veda Nistragunya Bhavajana. It's a Sanskrit term which this ancient literature was written in, spoken in and written in, um, which describes Krishna describes rise above these three modes of action, become transcendental. It's basically everything in this material world is going on under the direction, it's like a puppeteer or something, where it's being moved around by the modes of nature. We don't really have spiritually speaking, freedom and such. Um, and we're conditioned uh, to react, people react in different ways to the same thing because the different modes are working on them. A person in the mode of ignorance may not be attracted so much to beautiful art or sort of very kind of peaceful music or whatever it is. And similarly when in the mode of passion um, you know, their type of music may be very very strong rock music or very fast or, or something like that. Those are the good might most likely be more attracted to more classical or, or you know, sitar music or things which are a little bit more kind of peaceful or just more you know, just more like that. Um, so different people they react differently. It's the same thing because the modes of nature. But the soul is the same, not the same in the sense of there's only one soul. The nature or the quality of the soul in every body is the same. We're individuals and we have the same quality. It's just that we're covered over. And because of these coverings and the ignorance, the word of ignorance, which covers the living entity's identity. So we forget who we are. We more or less live our lives 
based upon whatever our material condition is, and based upon that, with the different desires and habits, subtle desires and habits that come along on the subtle body, um, driving us to try to en enact them or fulfill those desires on the gross fat one. Um, but forgetting entirely about the seer, the person who's seeing it, the person behind behind the desires, and we all see everybody. They, they say, my mind. I'm having a lot of trouble with my mind these days. We people may say, oh, I've got my body. I've got so many problems with my body. You know, it's kind of it's logical to, even if we don't believe or have any realization of spiritual nature whatsoever. It's, it, one would start to think, well, wait a minute, if I'm having problem with my body, then who am I that's having problem with my body? It's not, oh, body is having problem with body. You don't say that. Mind is having problem with the mind. You don't say that either. You say, I am having a problem with my mind. There's so many mental problems. So to think, who is that I that is seemingly from a living experience, seemingly something different to that which is seen, or that which is experienced, or that which is, you know, felt, whatever it is. It, it is just, I mean, it's not just logical, it's, it's just a daily factual experience, which we're missing due to the influence of ignorance. Um, that you've forgotten, we're like a dreaming state, you could say. So, knowledge is to wake us up from that dreaming state. So, let's see what the characteristics of people are. O oh, sinless one, the mode of goodness, being purer than the others, is illuminating. And it frees one from all sinful reactions. We become Maybe unknowingly we become entangled in this material world in so many karmic reactions, good or bad. They're both binding. Um, most people don't want to get free from the results of their good activities. They like to enjoy those. But we like to become free of their reactions from their sinful activities. So when we act in the mode of goodness, or that's a deep topic, but just in principle, that helps to free us from the reactions from the sinful activities which we may have committed or activities which have caused harm to ourselves or the living entities in this world. Those situated in the mode of, in this mode, become conditioned to a sense of happiness and knowledge. But in the mode of goodness also, we become attached. We become very attached. Living a nice life, we could say it material is good. But it's not spiritual, and it binds us also, because we become very attached to that style of living, a very natural living style, you know, very, trying to be kind to people, and as a living entity, living natu more naturally. It's not to be discouraged, but in of itself it's still material, and it will not free the soul from conditioning in this world. Again, as I say, we're coming in the middle here. So, earlier in the Bhagavad Gita, the, the topics are clear, more, let's say, directed towards the purpose of our existence, the purpose of life, um, and to understand the difference between the soul, the living conscious, living being, and the material body um, which we're living in um, at this point in time, anyway. To understand the difference between the two and how to understand that difference and what is the ultimate destiny or purpose of the soul and what's the purpose of the material world. Many, many topics in karma, how it works, etc. Um, and how the soul transmigrates. Many different topics have been discussed. So in this chapter we're basically described, discussing how the material energy, uh, how the different living entity is conditioned by the material energy react in different situations or become attached to different situations but everyone in the material world is basically in darkness as far as spiritual realization goes obviously there are some who are not but most people are very much on the mental or bodily platform of life and decisions are made 
even up to the point of wars and so many things, based upon this ignorance of our identity. Thinking I'm a man or a woman, human being or a dog, thinking I'm American or Russian or Chinese or Hindu or Buddhist or atheist or whatever it is that we identify ourselves with, all of which are illusions in terms of reality. They exist only temporarily. And they're just labels um, according to our conditioning. We have these different labels. So those in the mode of passion, the mode of passion is born of unlimited desires and longings. And we all know that, right? We have so many desires coming. I don't know what the, uh, they have some number. How many thoughts come into the brain every minute? I don't know. How many? There's some numbers in there. Somebody said there was a, uh, an estimate. Thousands of minutes. I don't know where they get it. But so many dis different thoughts coming into our minds. Not so much our mind, but the mind, yes, on, on the interaction between mind and body is the brain. Through the brain, so many different thoughts are there, um, which we try to, well, most of them just pass by. Um, many of them we try to fulfill. It's full of different desires. Those in the world of passion are full of never-ending longings. No matter what we do, we want more and more. And we're not satisfied, hankering for this, hankering for that. So many different things. Osana Kunti, another name of Arjuna. And because of this, the embodied, in this material body we're embodied, the embodied living entity is bound to material food of activity. We're like tying ourselves up. Dying ourselves up with so many desires and endless pursuit to try to fulfill them. And I, maybe you have some practical experiences of that. Yeah. I certainly have in my life. But uh, you know, you think, now if I get this, then I'll be satisfied. But no, another thing, another thing. And the material world is like that. The living entity is never fully satisfied. Because we're actually, the whole idea is that understanding the Bhagavad Gita is, is that we're not this body. And the purpose of human life is to bring an end to this what's called samsara cycle, to get free from the bondage or the entanglement. The, the, it's interesting that the name, Sanskrit name for the modes of nature, is called gunas. Guna means, it can mean the modes of nature, but it also means a rope. It's like we're twined up in a rope in the material, entangled in a rope. And when we're tied up in a rope, it's pretty hard to get out. We generally need someone else's help, generally speaking. It's very hard to us. So, because she's giving us help. She's giving us some direction here, how we can get out of the bondage of the material existence. O son of Bharat, know that the mode of darkness was born of ignorance, is the delusion of all embodied living entities. The results of this mode are madness, indolence, and sleep. We bind the conditioned soul. Of course we need sleep, but not more than required. Um, some people will just sleep as much as they can, um, and practically that's their sense of enjoyment. They don't have any particular objective in life or ambitions not so much driven by the mode of passion. Um, what to speak of enlightenment. They're mostly just resigned to a kind of uh, life of inertia, laziness, and just hanging around, sleeping, dirty, uh, whatever. Okay? Maybe begging, maybe resorting to liquor, and all kinds of things, just whatever they can get. But it has no real objective outside of itself. There's no, those in the world of passion, at least they have a material objective. Those in the world of goodness have a higher objective. And those in the world of ignorance, their objection is the objective is usually just to exist. More or less like an animal species. Yeah. Oh, son of Bharat, the mode of goodness conditions one to happiness. Passion considers conditions one to fruit of activity and ignorance covering one's knowledge binds one to madness. But madness is not only when somebody is, you could say, mentally unstable or whatever, but it's this 
Uh, and madness means more than that. I mean, a person mad, false identity, for instance. When we see someone on the street, sometimes you see it. Maybe not so much in Dublin, but in Asia, where parts of Asia where I go, you sometimes see them on the street. They're, they're you know, thinking that they're somebody, Jesus Christ or Bonaparte, Napoleon, or something, and they dress a little bit like them sometimes, or try to behave like them, or they think, many times I've seen in Malaysia, particularly, people in the middle of the roundabout, you know, at some crossroads, they stand there, someone drives down half crazy, directing the traffic as if he's a traffic warden or something. And everybody knows their terminology may change now, but it used to be called mad, maybe it's mentally challenged, or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Everybody knows they're not in they're not in stable state of mind, so they took all mad or whatever. But actually, everybody in the material world, to some degree, is in that state because we're identifying ourselves with what we're not. That's what Maya means to think we're something which we're not. I mean, that's what it basically means. And I'm pretty sure everyone's like that, thinking I'm French, English, American, Australian, New Zealand, whatever. Indian, wherever we're from, we identify with that. And this is a form of madness. It doesn't have to. Uh, it can be useful too if you use it properly, but in of itself, it is, is a form of madness, a false identity. A person who thinks there's something which they're not, or they don't know who they are. If you, if somebody, if you meet someone, who are you? I don't know. Where are you from? I don't know. Where are you going? I don't know. Uh, why are you doing, why are you in this situation now? I don't know. Um, you think there's something wrong, because you've got a problem. But in spiritually speaking, we're all in that boat. We don't really know where we came from. We can say, I came from Mum. But where from the living entity came from, Mum never created that. She may have been an instrumental in the body's appearance, but the soul, the living conscious being, where does that come from, or who, where do they come from? We may not know. Where we go when we die, we may not know. And even while we're suffering and enjoying now, we may not know. Not really. We may have some vague ideas, but not the real understanding. You may be rich and still miserable, and maybe poor and be happy. It's not something that can be defined by external, you know, halves having various external facilities necessarily. Um, so, anyway, everyone becomes, uh, it's covered in this way. Sometimes the mode of goodness becomes prominent defeating the modes of passion and ignorance for son of art, and sometimes the mode of passion defeats goodness and ignorance. There was a changing. You know, I'll give an example. I mean, we used to go, or still do, I said, on, on the streets of the cities in England when I was younger, and now where I am in France, or so, so. but uh, and you meet people on the streets, and I remember vividly sometimes in the same day, in the same place, you meet somebody and they're, no, damn, go away, I don't want no, no, nothing to do with it. Four hours later they come back and they say, well, what is this? And uh, they start asking questions. And the modes of nature working upon them have changed. It's like the weather, because in, in Ireland the weather doesn't change much, does it? <laughs> what? It's very stable. Very stable. Is that right? It's always like this, isn't it? Warm and sunny. Is that right? That's a joke. Is it a joke? Yeah. What are you moving here then? <laughs> <laughs> um, was it yesterday? Was it warm and sunny yesterday? No? <laughs> Raining yesterday. And I think in a few days. It's changing, isn't it? The world's always changing. Wasn't it George Harrison? Didn't he make a one record, what was it called, Forever Changing or something? Can't remember, something like that. All things must pass, right? All things must pass, but it's about, you know, things are always changing. Everybody is changing, the weather is changing, people are changing. Everything is changing in this world constantly. And we're witnessing these changes. Oh my goodness, we sit around and say, oh, things have changed so much, you know. Oh, hasn't he grown older? And well, who is that who's grown older? The body has grown older. The world's changing. We're looking at where the seer, there's a difference between the seer, the seeing, and the means of seeing. 
or the knower, knowledge, and the means of knowing. There's a difference that the body and the mind, we can say, are the instruments to interact, to see, to know, and so on, to touch. And that around us, the material energy is the seen, or the touched, or the heard. Um, and we are the conscious of the entity. With, the, with no soul in the body, there's no action, there's nothing going on. It's like this, well, totally with it, looks like this. Um, because the soul has moved on. And what happens when the soul leaves the body? Question mark. Most people feel nothing. They feel that's the end of my, my existence. But they don't know who I am. When we realize a little bit who we are, it takes on a little bit of a different perspective. So understanding the modes of nature is important also in knowing how we are conditioned and how we can get out of this condition. But the modes are always changing like this, just like the weather is always changing. Hmm. Next verse. The manifestation of mode of goodness can be experienced when all the gates of the body are illuminated by knowledge. That's kind of a bit of a subtle statement, you could say. Um, but it means to say that, you know, uh, cleanliness, uh, our speech, our hearing, everything is more or less It's more, more or less um, engaged or directed in that way, by the mode of goodness. You know, as we've already mentioned a little bit. Like food, you may be not hearing in this chapter, but later on in the 17th chapter we'll hear about the foods that persons in various modes are attracted to eating. Vegetarian foods, foods which are very subtle, very healthy, and so on. Uh, and smells are attracted to sweet smells of fragrant flowers, etc. Kind of with a sense of the law attracted to the mode of goodness, regulation, cleanliness. All these are symptomatic of one more influenced by goodness than passion. But as I said, everyone's influenced by all the modes, but not just one. But that's some of the some of the symptoms of the mode of goodness. O chief of the Bharats, Arjuna, when there is an increase in the mode of passion, the symptoms of great attachment. I never see a child how, become, how they become so attached, eh? some toy, maybe not seem to be very significant to us, but to the child it's something very important. And you try to take it off, no, they're very, very, very attached. Sometimes it's very hard to, to do it, even if it's a dangerous thing sometimes. Um, it's hard, very much attached. We become very attached to things naturally. In fact, it's the nature of the soul to attach. It's just the nature, or let's say the object of the attachment, which is maybe different. But to be attached is very much, you could say, a natural thing, a living entity. Therefore, in the general understanding, we should try to become attached earlier in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna also said, Vishaya Vinivati. Nirahara Siddhina, Rasavajan, so Krishna. Parambrushta, the Bhagavate. You have to try to become attached to something better, something higher. You're going to be attached to somebody, something, naturally. But to try to become attached to something which is really valuable, something which will really help us, something which will really satisfy us. Not just to become attached to something because it has a temporary taste. Just like when we arrive today, in the airport. What was that sign about Guinness? Do you remember what I see? What did it say? Oh yeah, the highlight of your trip to Dublin. Guinness! Big poster in the airport. The highlight of your visit to Dublin. Guinness! Stout? Is it stout? Okay. Guinness. The highlight. Imagine. That's the highlight. People can't think of anything or don't know anything higher than that. We're in a bit of a sorrowful state. We're certainly not in a spiritual state, that's for sure. They may call it spirit, but it's a kind of spirit. Intoxicating. Um, but like that, people have... Because they don't know 
Because you have no spiritual, higher spiritual religion doesn't really give it in general. It's just some kind of way of atoning for our misbehavior or something. Feel a bit more good about life or something. I don't know. But actually spiritual knowledge, we will no longer have an interest in anything which is unnecessary. We have to live, we have to maintain. Unnecessary, yes. There's so many unnecessary things. Take, for instance, one item. Hey, where's it gone? Where's my mobile? I had it in my pocket. Where is it? I gave it to you. What did you do? Huh? Huh? Did you hear what he said? I gave him my mobile earlier on. My mobile. And he may have lost it. Wasn't that wonderful news? Wouldn't you be happy if you lose your mobile? Some people are. But generally speaking, people are not. Manu, probably? Did we, he picked us up at the airport. And he wouldn't panic me exactly, but he said, oh my goodness. I must have left the ticket in the machine. You know, you pay for parking. And, and he was you know, on the way back to look for the ticket as if you'll find it in the machine. Fifty other people have been there since we were there. But you know, lost the ticket. Now what am I going to do? What am I going to do now? Huh? No proof of when you came in. Right? Maximum fine. Hello. Fortunately, we found the ticket. It's like at first, it's like, oh no, oh no, I've lost the ticket. And if someone, if you lose your mobile, how do you feel? Have you ever lost your mobile? Panic? To be honest. I've seen many people, they really panic. It's like, almost like they've lost their best friend or husband or something. I think more than that. You panic more than that. It's like, Everything is like your life form is revolving around that mobile phone. Um, you get so attached, dependent, in the mode of passion. You see. You've created a society which is really revolving <coughs> around the mode of passion, very much so nowadays. Isn't it? The whole monetary system, financial system, is all strongly around the mode of passion. The technological system of the world. And Everything very packed, the consumer society, very passionate. You try to live a bit simply, let's put it simply, in the mode of goodness. You can do it, but it's to some degree, but it's still very hard. You know, I'll tax you for your land, you've got to pay this, you've got to pay that. You're not insured, you can't do this. You know, they, they, they put so many, those influenced by the mode of passion who are running this sort of show, uh, they try to put so many restrictions and controls on everybody, yeah? Where are you going now? Where are you up to? <coughs> huh? Mode of passion again, huh? Yeah. Eh? <laughs> Running. Yeah, flying away. She's got to go to London. Going to London? Yeah. When are you coming back? On the 30th. 30th? Yeah. Uh -huh. You're going alone? Uh, no, I'm going with Jai for two days. Where is she? Well, have a good trip. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful badger early on. That was so sweet. Thank you. And all the best. Thank you for being here. Hare Krishna. We'll see you later, Manu Prabhu. Savi Sachi Prabhu? Yeah. Okay. The body coming in also at the same time. Hare Krishna. Um, yeah, whatever it is. Sometimes we even lose our toothbrush if we get upset. Huh? be anything where you become attached to or to speak of our body or people who are very close to us temporarily but we can see everything in this world we're going to lose it in a sense sooner or later you can't keep anything in this world because it doesn't really belong to us we just have a temporary connection with it whatever it may be uh, when there is an increase in the mode of passion the symptoms of great attachment fruitive activity intense endeavor and uncontrollable desire and hankering to love. Sometimes it's uncontrollable. We go mad sometimes. Wars, fights between people, arguments. So many things take place because of this artificial attachment. When there's an increase in the mode of ignorance of a son of crew, 
darkness, inertia, madness, and illusion are manifested. More or less the same appeal. When one dies in the mode of goodness, he attains to the higher planets in the universe. Or planets where there are great saintly personal living. When one dies in the mode of passion, he takes birth amongst those engaged in fruitive activities. You know, it's the same thing, you just carry on with the same mode that you leave your body in. And when one dies in the mode of ignorance, he takes birth in the lower species of life. The results of pious activities, uh, pious action, is pure, and is said to be in the mode of goodness. But action done in the mode of passion results in misery, ultimately. Maybe in the beginning we get some pleasure, but then when we lose it, misery. And action performed in the mode of ignorance results in foolishness. Or maybe you're not even aware of what's going on, just totally dull. Some people say, you know, they say, um, this, this mode is, I can't remember the, the terminology, but you know, being foolish is like, you know, yeah, like good in a sense, because you don't know what's going on. Don't care either, but still you have to get the result eventually, you get the reaction. So they said ten verses, and that's ten verses. So I guess we kind of finished there. Um, but here is recommended that pious activity. Find out what pious activities are. They're not just creations of our mind, or votes of a government, votes or some concoctions of some kind. They're activities, actually, in the, not in this chapter, but you see earlier on in the Bhagavad Gita, in the um, fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, is describing uh, three kinds of actions. They're called karma, vikarma, and akarma. When we talk, they're all karma mentioned there. But v karma means actions, whimsical actions, actions according to our own sensual drive, our own, you know, desires and so on. They're not regulated by anything other than that. Maybe some laws of the state. But actual karma, um, in terms of this definition, actual karma means action, material action may still be attached. It is action which is done according to scriptural or spiritual religious directions in our life, which helps us to gradually become released from samsara or released from karma, and is gradually becoming released. But that's karma. Be karma means acting actions not according to that principle of following scriptural or spiritual directions coming down. And akarma means activities which have no reaction. So karma has a good reaction, the karma has a negative reaction. And akarma has no reaction. It, akarma means activities which are really, have, they're not for fruitful results. They're activities for a purely spiritual purpose, um, in knowledge of the situation, and not acting to achieve anything material per se. Um, material results will come, no doubt, it's the nature of this world, but one's not acting, one's not attached, anashita karma karma, karma karma, roti cha, yeah. so sanyasi chiyogi cha, nanaradni na cha, this one explains it, one acts, but without attachment to the results, acting is a course of duty, um, not giving up activity, but acting without that attachment to it, understanding the purpose of the material world and one's own goal in life, etc. Acting in knowledge helps to free us from all kinds of reactions in this world and free us from the entanglement in the world of nature. So we can gradually rise above them and no longer be affected by stress and anxiety, duality, and all the other effects that we experience in this material world around us. One can slack in the world but not be affected by it. So that the next verses in this 14th chapter will discuss a little bit about that process of transcending these modes of nature. Okay, our time is up, the verses are up. Are there any questions? Overwhelming you all or something. <laughs> this is 
And we are from, this is not particularly hot for summer, at least, is it? In the summer, I, you know, you can get really hot there in Australia. I know I've coughs, but I've, I've been in temperatures of 48 degrees in, in Australia. Sometimes. Centigrade, that is, by the way. Not Fahrenheit, centigrade. That's like, uh, I guess it's about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. I don't think you get that in Dublin very often. Maybe in the sauna. But not otherwise. But the day is nice, it's a very good day. Any questions? When you talk about acting according to the mother of goodness, it's very much association. Excuse me? It's very much by the, like the effect of the mode of nature, isn't it? Very much by the association. Good point. The by association, we become conditioned, which we on. By coming in contact. Coming in contact with the modes of nature is not just some, like, even some physical, I want to say, not nature type association, it means people. It includes, specifically, it means the people we associate with, um, and their natures, which affect us. We, we've all picked up various concepts, perspectives of life, by association over many lifetimes, as well as this lifetime. We're born in this lifetime of certain tendencies, of certain desires as a result of our past. Sometimes people tend to think that, you know, only that which has happened in this life is the result of our present circumstance. It certainly is, uh, you know, relevant, and it certainly does have an effect, but it's not the only cause of our circumstance. People are born already with certain tendencies. You see that amongst children. I mean, we were at the airport, well, they were on the same flight as the third. Did you see the two twins in the, in the pram? There's this one family, little tiny babies, I mean, maybe a few months old, they're twins. And they look pretty much identical at that stage, but you know, they'll be like later on. But you know, they, they're doing different things, and they're twiddling their fingers and toes in different directions, and looking in different directions. It's not like they're identical, you know what I mean? They've got different, something different is already there. Whether well, they're born more or less at the same time from the same mother, etc., etc., but they've got differences. And that's as understood as a result why one person is born in Ireland, one person. How many of you are born in Ireland here today? Born in Ireland. A few of you are born in Ireland. How many of you are born in Australia? Anybody? Anyone else? Anyone born in, I don't know if I. And say across the border. Anyone born? <laughs> is there is there a wall? There? Have they started building the wall yet? Not yet. No. Are they going to build one, or what are they going to do? If Trump gets his way, they'll build one. Right? Huh? Dig a moat. <laughs> Fill it up with Guinness stuff. <laughs> whatever they know, what they're going to do. Anyone from England, UK, whatever you call it? No, oh, not many. Where are you all from? <laughs> not from Ireland, not from England. You're from Australia. You're from England. You're from England. You're from England. You're born in England. Sunbathing, Wolverhampton. They've got a lot of sun in Wolverhampton. Where are you from? Where are you from? India? Who's from India? Anyone from India? One, two, three, four, five. Ah! A lot from India. Anyway, wherever you're from, all different places around the world, and, you know, we develop you know, by association different. I know when we were kids, we that was the time when, just after the Second World War, and you know, <coughs> kind of, I suppose, it, I don't know if we call it the Cold War at that time, but there was this kind of you know, animosity started to develop between the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc, which I'm sure you all know about. The communist countries and capitalist countries, and you know, our mentality towards it, the way I was brought up, without ever having met anybody from the other side, so to speak, we were conditioned to think that they're all, you know, like, ah, nasty, terrible people. And that was basically how we were conditioned, but we never met any of them. And when I went to Russia a long time later, 
and I talked to some of the persons similar age to my, myself, and they had the same, you know, perception of people from the Western, nasty, you know, whatever, horrible, you know, robes, whatever it is. It's, it's just condition to who we associate with, or where we associate, what we get put into us. But we're born in a certain situation, not by chance either. That's a result of our already existing or the karma from our previous lives. And we're born with those particular desires and tendencies. Inert, maybe, but in a circumstance where they will come up in due course of time by association. And then you will have maybe some other slight variations of association evolving slowly, slowly, slowly. So like this, the purpose of this is that we can become conscious. And if we want, we can consciously change that never-ending cycle called samsara, if we want. That's the choice. But this is our real choice when we, when we no longer just follow the dictates of our conditioning. So association is the key factor because Early on, we mentioned that when you're tied up with rope, you know you can't get out on your own. You need someone to help. So, similarly, spiritual life, we do need association of persons who are more spiritually aware, awakened, if we want to become spiritually awakened ourselves. So it works. And they may give us, like we were hearing earlier on. I don't know um, what's the young lady who was leading the, the chanting earlier. What's her name? Pardon. Rosie. Huh? Rosie. Rosie. Rosie? Nice, thank you. So Rosie, uh, how did I get on to Rosie? I don't know. Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, the, okay, this process. Kirtan. So this, this, she was singing, not just singing, that's not one thing anyone anyway, may sing, but singing, what she was singing was not an, or, an ordinary song the mantra. So yes, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, if someone comes into the association of, the, of mantras, which really mean that which help control or pacify our minds. And this particular mantra, go look at it in the Dharma, being honest and get down, is that coming from the spiritual world, it's, it, it, it's a spiritual sound vibration, which appears in this world to give us association give us a chance to automatically purify our consciousness. So we no longer become so overwhelmed by the laws of nature for passion, whatever rage, whatever it may be that we're conditioned by, attached. So we become purified, so we become purified of the false ego and the false identities that we have, and the various um, unwanted or uh, lusty desires, whatever it is that's covering us. Envy, could be uh, anger, greed, so many coverings of that. Yes? How much does the governments of the different countries in, have influence on the modes of nature? How much do they have influence? Yeah. It's more the other way around, the modes of nature are influencing them. And their activities, they're instrumental in a sense. And it's again not by chance, it's like you know, we probably all over the world people complain about the government, probably. We vote them in and then they get in and we complain about them. <laughs> you know, we really don't know. <laughs> We're in ignorance, we don't really know. But uh, they're under the emotions of nature and they're bad, basically speaking, in one sense. They're enacting, their actions are. Are, are, are enacting or let's say facilitating our own conditioning, our own karma. You know, there's nothing really to blame. We're, you know, we take responsibility for our own situation. Although we tend to blame the government or some people or somebody or another for our fate that we're in. But they're also under the influence of the modes of nature, and completely, and obviously, different persons in government are influenced differently by different modes. And naturally, they're going to try to impress or impose their particular concepts or their spray, their initiatives, etc., through their work. And that obviously is going to influence other people. But it's not by chance these are in the situation 
I'm where that so and so is in government with a certain party and has a certain policy which they're imposing on us, um, it's not the chance either. You don't have to be overwhelmed by it, but you may be affected by it. Um, so they're not actually, they're not controlling the net and modes, they're instruments too. And they have their own individual karmas and their actions are basically playing out their own karmas. So in that way we don't feel. Not to say we should just therefore stand back and do nothing. Uh, the endeavor should try to be in, to improve things, at least to try to bring it to the mode of goodness. Um, but not very often you find somebody who is in the mode of goodness is able to, to um, say, get in a position like that where they can help them. Sometimes, but not so much. It's usually people in the mode of passion who have their, their own you know, particular perspectives. And um, that's the age we're in particular is this uh, situation. Therefore, in this age, at this point in time anyway, you can't expect too much. And there's no point in moaning and wiping, groaning about it all the time too. Depending on what time, just, you know, so what they call it, whinging, whinging <laughs> about the way things are, you know, the weather, <laughs> the weather, the government, you know. The way people behave, I was whinging a bit in the airport today, I'll give an example, you know, you know we, we two came in late, a little late, you know, and uh, there was no seats left. We were in this airport called Tour, you've probably never heard of it. It's about as big as a local bus station, maybe half the size, tiny little place. And, uh, you know, I've noticed a big change in society, at least as one as that one. I wasn't necessarily whinging, I was just pointing out the change. There was nowhere to sit, and you got like one like, teenage kid after another sat on all these chairs, just glued to their mobile phones or some PlayStation or something, not even looking up to care less about anybody else whatsoever about but themselves. They don't care a damn about anyone else, by the way. All they care about is themselves. They're not being educated properly. They may be going to university or school, but they're not learning even basic human behavior. When I was a young child, and I still remember the day, that we didn't have aeroplanes we had, but we never went on one. Trains and buses were the most we could expect. And if you did not stand up when an elderly person came along, from your seat, you knew it. You got it very quickly. Ouch! Right? Now you can't do that. You still learn your lessons, you know. Show respect. Otherwise, people are growing up with me in the center all the time. And, you know, this is education. Leaders in society are supposed to show by example as well as educate others. We don't get that very often. Sometimes, but not very often. And difficult sometimes with the law being established now is a slightly different paradigm. Um, but things like that, you know. Little, that's just one example. We gave hundreds. You would open an old lady trying to cross the road. Same thing. If you didn't help her cross the road, you knew it. If your father was around, somebody knew you was around, they, they let you know it. Mm. I don't know, maybe repeat some of things, but you know, you, it's your duty to help somebody, elderly person, or somebody sick, or whatever. It was your duty. It wasn't like, you know, you had to pay, how much you're going to pay me to do it, you know, something like that. It was, it was still automatic, you, you, just the way in association. So now we don't get that so much for whatever reason. I'm not saying it's not there, but it's not so much. Things have changed. What do you do? You try to show an example, you try to educate. But, uh, you know, the modern lifestyle that we live is a bit passionate, to say the least. Very passionate. And revolving in ignorance of No understanding of the real purpose of life, our spiritual identity, the results of the way we behave. We have very little understanding. People think their body is mine, I can do what I like with it. That's a good philosophy which is coming recently. This body is mine, I can do whatever I like with it. Well, you can live like that. You have a choice. 
when a person in the mode of goodness realizes his body is an instrument, a very valuable instrument, he should use it for a valuable purpose, not just inordinate. And cause ourselves harm. It's a shame because people are harming themselves. So we're trying to, middle way at least, trying to give some understanding to help people to stop acting in a way which will cause harm to themselves and to others. Playing with the fire. And the leaders are not doing that in general. In general. I'm not saying everyone, but in general. Some of them are more influenced by. And a little bit more than what it was, but mostly by the mother passion. Mostly. But because people want that, it's probably there. <laughs> they want, you know, that's why I say we don't whinge and complain because you can you get, so to speak. That doesn't mean we don't try, try to make some change. So we don't whinge about what we've got either, you know. We try to improve it or something. I was really complaining our whole lives about this sort of that. And we'll go nowhere. Hare Krishna, thank you all very much. We'll have a little chanting now, um, five or ten minutes, and then we'll, um, I think there's a little bit of refreshment, so if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Who, who's, is there anyone here who's kind of aware of what's going on? I mean, I don't mean spiritually, but I mean in terms of the program, the yeah, evening program. Is there anyone who's aware? Man who has gone. Ah, oh, here, we, here we have Amanda. Amanda Vikram Prabhu, you know what's going on. What's happening next? There are some refreshments coming. Refreshments, we need refreshing. Can we have a little chanting in any time? Actually, Amanda, what can you leave? Yes, you can. Where's the harmonia? <laughs> you can do it. This is Rasik and Anato. You're traveling with me for a year, nearly two years. He's actually a, a qualified dentist. He works as a, work, he was working as a dental, in the dental world, dental surgeon. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's all right. The harmonia is there. You can do it. He's very, he gets very shy.
Hare Krishna 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 Hare Krishna uh-huh.